Welcome to the GeoTape inaugural semester conference. Our speaker today is Julia Gell from UT Dallas. She'll talk about coupling time aware multi persistence knowledge representation with spatio super graph convolutional networks for time series forecasting. Take it away, Julia. Yeah, thank you very much. I, I'm really grateful for, uh, you know, I'm very grateful to organizers for inviting me here. And, you know, I, I've, uh, I, I learned about GeoTop recently, but it turns out that actually it's, uh, it has a long history and certainly, you know, I'll, I'll be a regular, uh, participant in this, in the series. So I'll try to attend, um, uh, again and again. Um, so I also would like to say if, if, uh, if you think that I'm actually also at a national science foundation right now. So I need to acknowledge support uh, from NSF. Uh, and, uh, I also would like to say that I am not algebraic topologist. Okay. So I started in pure math, my PhD is in applied math, but I've been doing statistics, uh, for 20 years and most recently machine learning. So I'm not algebraic topologist. I guess I'm trying to link, uh, some of the TDA concepts with, uh, statistics and machine learning. Um, and I would like to say that, um. This work uh, is in uh, collaboration with um, Yuju Chen, uh, who used to be a student here in UC Dallas, and then he moved to Princeton, and he's right now assistant professor in CS in Temple University. Uh, my colleague at UC Dallas, who is algebraic topologist, um, Barish Kruskunuder, and my former postdoc, Ignacio Segovia Dominguez, who has just started his uh, assistant professor's position in math, statistics and math, data science in West Virginia University. Okay, so um, let me uh, start from a uh, motivation. So why, why we decided to, to look at this problem and how we, I mean, how it all all these ideas were born. So uh, about three years ago, DARPA has opened um, a call for proposals on uh, time-aware machine learning. So essentially the, the key idea there was that uh, most machine learning algorithms or uh, deep learning algorithms, they, they tend to be static. So we do not really incorporate uh, time dimension inherently within their architectures. And as a result, um, you either start losing the connection between your model and real world. And so you, you, you have much worse, uh, you, your performance deteriorates or you need frequently to update your model, which is very costly and sometimes is impossible. Uh, so you need to have newer and newer data and, uh, and resources. So, um, so we tried to, to submit a proposal for this DARPA call and we were unsuccessful, but that proposal actually raised a whole bunch of ideas within our group on how to tackle this problem. And, um, that's, that's the topic of my, uh, today's talk. So I'd like to show how we can incorporate multi-persistence with uh, dynamic components within deep learning in order to uh, better assess time evolving objects. That could be time series, that can be spatial temporal processes, or it can be time evolving graphs. Okay, so since this seminar is actually on TDA, so everybody is very, very familiar with uh, this part, but I would like to highlight a few points that are particularly important for uh, ML and statistics. So one is that we can extract information from the underlying uh, uh, data objects in a coordinate free manner. Okay, that's, that's, that's of huge importance for both statistics and ML. And because Topology originally starts data that are invariant to minor to, to continuous transformations. Yes. So uh, the premise is that what we're going to get out of, uh, the some topological summaries that we get out. 
shall be more robust than traditional statistical methods based, for example, on moments or even on ranks. Okay. So, uh, the, as fr from a statistical perspective, I would say that's one of the primary things why today is 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 very useful in in data science and in, in practical data analysis because we we shall not view topological summaries um, as a new thing that will completely substitute what we have done in statistics. It won't happen, but it provides very important complementary information that is likely to be much more robust than we have ever done in in statistics. Of course, from computational perspective, uh, we can get all the summaries in a compressed form, so we get the compressed representation of shape. Okay, so um, the way, you know, like, if I try to explain it to students, or someone who is not familiar uh, with um, topology, we can look at that through art, okay? So I, I very much like impressionism, and it took me a while actually to find a good, a good picture of like showing that, and I'm still not completely satisfied, but the idea is there, okay? So um, there is such a, um, art technique uh, in post-impressionism, which is called pointillism. Essentially, uh, you can just have this, the whole picture for points, okay? And then, uh, viewer need to blend those points together, either through uh, color or range uh, and so on, so get the whole picture. So if we, here we see um, George Seurat, uh, the surface fragment, okay? So if we look very close, to, uh, at, at this picture, then we'll see just a bunch of points. It's, it's nothing. But if we stand farther away, then we'll see that it's a man. And that's actually a circle, so it's... Um, so that, that's the idea. So we somehow, and that's the, the idea is actually very deep, because it's not simply points that are close to each other that we can uh, link together. Uh, we somehow in our brain need to link points that maybe similar in color, maybe similar in shape, okay? So it's, if you think about this from um, a male perspective or statistics perspective, yes, so maybe we can find the corresponding similarity functions that we are gonna later on use in persistent homology based on color and based on, based on, uh, geographical distance between points, and maybe based on just shape of points itself. So that's a good, I, I think that's a good example, um, emphasizing the role that we can and shall use sometimes multiple filtering functions. Okay, and that, that brings us to uh, multi-persistence. And I hope it will work this It always takes, uh, Ignacio has prepared this wonderful uh, illustration how TD work works, but sometimes it doesn't. Just. Okay, so this, the, you have this number, they, they have you these points, yes, and then you start um, growing circles around them, the neighborhoods, and whenever the circles uh, overlap, will connect. Okay, so that's another idea of pointillism, yes? And so at, at some stage of filtration, we'll see letters. The letters are NSF, National Science Foundation, because I gave this talk at NSF some time ago. So, and then it's interesting that eventually, if we keep connecting or, uh, those points, then it will come a complete graph. And we, we really see nothing anymore again. So the idea is that at some there should be some optimal point where we still get a lot of information out of our data. Uh, and then once again, the you know the utility of this tool deteriorates. So it's, it's, it's important to find that sweet spot in terms of uh, thresholds when we do uh, filtrations. And then this is a bar plot and the uh, barcode, and this is a persistent diagram. So that's very familiar for, for this audience. It's also very familiar technique. 
So if we now go towards uh, applications of uh, system homology, the way how to, we start with data, we'll get this filtration as that uh, simply show complexes, then we'll uh, extract topological summaries that could be in the form of uh, landscapes, uh, curves, persistent curves, um, and, you know, persistent, uh, somehow vectorizing persistent diagrams in terms of persistent images, uh, like Henry Anders, and many, many other ways of, of doing that. Characterization, and then after we have extracted the features, usually in a twice differentiable form, then we can bring it into deep learning. So why twice differentiability is important here? Because then we can run the convolution operators within deep learning. So since I would say 2016-2017, there there have been many many papers that focus on single parameter persistence. So that is when we pick up one filtering function, uh, for example, going back to uh, R, it can be just color, okay? And then get persistent image or other forms of casualization or landscape and incorporate that uh, within machine learning or deep learning model. And it works very well. Sometimes it improves performance. In most cases, it improves robustness. Okay, so that's very promising. However, there are many, many cases when you would like to have more than one filtering function. And again, going back uh, to the art example, that could be when your filtering function may be color and your filtering function may be distance between points. Can we do it together at the same time? Uh, we have also one of my former postdocs uh, started working on blockchain data, and he has shown that actually, if you find the appropriate filtering function on Bitcoin, you can identify some of anomalous behaviors, such as, for example, ransomware. Uh, so here you work with a Bitcoin transaction graph and extract certain features out of it, and if you are lucky enough to get the right filtering function, you can actually identify ransomware families. And moreover, you can predict that some of the transactions are ransomware, and this ransomware family, similar patterns have been seen before. So it's likely that the offers to this ransomware are the same people. So in case of Bitcoin, the two immediate candidates for filtering functions will be volume and number of blockchain transactions. Okay, so how how often do we trade between each other? For example, how often if say we start uh, sending bitcoins um, with in uh, Hasse and me, so then that that will be one indicator. Another one, how much money do we send? Okay, so they are both very very important, but how to incorporate them together? So the tool here uh, is multi-parameter persistence. And this tool tends to be still largely within pure math, although more and more papers appear in trying to scratch the surface and bring it to uh, real-world applications. But uh, the key bottleneck here is computational complexity. So uh, some of the most prominent, promising results for multi-persistence um, obtained based on the slicing argument. So that's when you project uh, essentially the filtering on two functions on a uh, single direction, okay, so on, on this slide. But the problem here is that um, the, the projection angle, so how you select the projection, so the, the slicing uh, idea, uh, will impact the uh, outcomes of your final model performance. Okay, so finding the optimal slicing uh, is computationally expensive and, you know, it doesn't scale up well for modern problems that we get in data science and machine learning. So that becomes a problem. 
um, still for if you do the slicing argument, uh, then uh, you enjoy many many important stability guarantees that that are very useful. But it still will largely be within very simple, either simple two examples or relatively small data sets. Okay, so that doesn't bring us to the whole new applications in ML. So the idea that we uh, follow that here is to bring, to, to, to merge um, the concepts of algebraic topology with linear algebra, okay? So what we do here is actually pretty simple idea, but it, it surprisingly turns out to be working well and being efficient in terms of computational cost. Suppose for, for a sec that we are looking at a series of time varying graphs. It can be other time varying objects, but we, we focus on graphs here. And we're going to look at a bifiltration, okay? And so we essentially uh, look at each direction, okay, uh, along, for example, filtration uh, f, with the function f, and filtration g. So that will be like this. So we'll have a two dimensional array, and within each direction, we just calculate the corresponding um, Euler Poincare characteristic, okay? So long rows and separately along columns, okay? Then, as a result, for each time snapshot, we're gonna have a separate Euler Poincare surface, Euler Poincare uh, uh, matrix, and then uh, through the sequence over time, we'll have a dynamic Euler Quark on surfaces. That's the original idea. Why it is good? Because it allows us to do two things. So it allows us to incorporate information simultaneously about filtrations in both directions. And at the same time, it, it is way more computationally efficient than slicing algorithms. Of course, nothing comes for free. We don't have the same uh, stability guarantees, but nevertheless, it's much. There, there have been other approaches where people try to use the staking algorithm uh, uh, argument, where we use uh, each filtration at the same time, and then they'll just stack the results. Okay, so that's that's a simple staking, but that doesn't work that well, as as I'll show later on. So here we still do it simultaneously. So it is still actual uh, the multi persistence, uh, but it's just done, you know, uh, element wise along rows and along columns. And here's a brief visualization of how it's done for this particular uh, graph. Okay. So now, um, can we prove something around this? And it turns out. But yes, we do. Of course, it will be much weaker uh, results on stability, but we still we can do it. And again, we take the ideas just from a linear algebra concepts. Okay, so we'll define if if you have two graphs and you have uh, two uh, Euler Poincaré surfaces for each of them. Okay, so those remember those Euler Poincaré surfaces are just matrices. So we can just look at the distance in terms of L1 matrix norm, okay? As simple as that, okay? Um, and uh, then we can move to, uh, to the results. Uh, because we can prove the stability uh, guarantees in terms of this weak L1 metric. So the idea here is that when we compare to Euler for career surfaces, uh, we're going to do that separately along columns, okay, and separately along rows, okay. And then we'll define uh, the final uh, uh, the final metric between uh, uh, two multi persistence for corresponding graphs as a max of the distance either along rows or along columns, okay. And turns out that, you know, the, our proposed Euler Poincare surface will be stable with respect to such weak L1 metric, okay? So it is, of course, much 
much weaker yourself, stability yourself than what you get in terms of uh, multi persistence slicing argument. But it's still useful enough uh, to bring it to such tools as anomaly detection and uh, spatial temporal forecasting and even hypothesis testing. Although hypothesis testing is still in our radar, but we haven't done it, but it's, it's still enough for most of those uh, uh, more applied stats and ML concepts. Okay, so um, now I would like to go to example showing how it does it help us. Okay, so ideas with multi persistence and bring them uh, in the graph neural networks, particularly focusing, as I said, on uh, time evolving uh, objects, learning of time evolving objects, such as graphs and spatial temporal data. And I, uh, <clears throat> and this, I, uh, as I said, like this was the primary motivation for us that came from uh, DARPA uh, call. But of course, the ideas that I present here, uh, they could be applicable even for static objects as well, where you you may you may be simply interested, like it's, it's in, in this art example. Uh, just on color as one filtering function and uh, distance between points is another filtering function. Uh, but going back to this uh, time evolving object, so the way how we have done here, this is like looks pretty complicated um, architecture, but it has multiple modules. So we have a graph or we have a space time object that we represent as a graph. And then um, we'll, uh, we'll have uh, multiple models. So one, it will be a, a spatial uh, a graph convolution, and I'll talk a little bit about that uh, in a sec. Uh, we'll have a feature transformation, okay? So that is all non-topological one. Uh, to account for the fact that we have multiple time steps together, so we can treat them just as a sequence or an alternative way is to treat them as a multi-layer network and get the appropriate location. I'll, I'll, I'll talk about that in a sec. So this is this um, uh, subgraph diffusion convolution with two multi-layer uh, time representation of our data. And this is actually, this module number four corresponds to uh, multi-persistence. So here, each corresponding multi-persistent uh, euler poincare surface then is uh, input into CNN, and then we'll have uh, the corresponding output, and then uh, all of these elements, all of these uh, outputs from the corresponding models uh, get into the uh, GRU level, and then we'll finally get the, the prediction for either for a graph behavior or for space-time object behavior. So I'd like to briefly highlight a few points that uh, showing how our architecture, uh, deep learning architecture. So I have a question. Yeah. Mm -hmm. If you could go back to the previous slide, mm -hmm. just in the in the fourth module, is that a variation of autoencoder? What kind of a, is that an autoencoder or a UMAP or like what kind of a, um, architecture do you have in the multi-persistence part? No, this is CNN. That, the, the number four? But yeah, that's a CNN, but then you have a parallel CNN, and then there's a red thing in the middle. Oh, yeah, yeah. Th this, so how this are you one, combining this, yeah. those two? This is autoencoder. This is just the usual autoencoder. Okay, that's what I was wondering. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, it is. Okay, so... Um, so I'd like to, yeah, thanks very much, yeah. So uh, so I'd like to highlight a few points how, how our, our architecture is different. So one is, um, so we here normalize self-adaptive metrics. So essentially when you learn through this graph structure, uh, you can have a predefined cost of staying at the same node versus going to the other node, okay? So that allows us to, um, better learn uh, through both 
short term and longer long range dependence on the graph. Okay, uh, so for you know, it's not and it's also not fixed. The the underlying graph structure is not fixed anymore, so it is learnable throughout the process because we'll have you can have different jumps in between nodes and that is based on the cost of the staying in the same node versus going to another node okay so it is more adaptive than just fixing fixing your graph structure right away uh, the next thing is a uh, spatial graph convolutional layer okay so here the idea is that we incorporate information both from uh, node representation uh, and um, the neighborhood of uh, surrounding uh, and and features from the surrounding neighborhood, as well as again, um, uh, you know, uh, accounting for a long, uh, longer range de uh, dependency throughout the graph structure. So you you do it both at the same space and time. And uh, finally. Uh, the module that I'm particularly interested in, because I, I found it, it's, I need to say it's, it's, we, it's the, the, the ultimate idea is not ours. We kind of extended it further, um, but I, I find it's actually very cool because I, I did a lot of time series myself. So uh, usually people, when they have a time dependent object, you have multiple snapshots. And you model them each at a time. Of course, they are dependent, maybe weekly dependence or whatever, yes. But the idea here is that what we do is that you have a time window. And within this time window, you collect all the objects and you treat them as a multi layer network. Okay. And, um, and it's going to be directed layer network. Why? Because you have, uh, <clears throat> time, time index. So to preserve causality across time, it is a directed network. Okay, so if you, for example, have observations on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, so you have a five layer, um, multi-layer network, and uh, it is dependent over time in terms of uh, uh, ages. And this, this is its representation. And so it, why, why it is good? Because it allows you not to split separate uh, time snapshots and treat them, I won't say independently, but you know, you need to treat dependence between them to some assumptions uh, as weak dependence or something like this. So here you, you get more information uh, about uh, cross dependency across uh, uh, among those days, because sometimes it may find out that Monday has more similarity with Friday than Monday has similarity with Tuesday, okay? And that typically is not um, feasible to do with more traditional uh, time series, statistical time series tools, or even machine learning tools, because here you can jump across uh, across days, but you still preserve uh, time time causality here, okay? So that's 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 a cool idea by 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 itself. And so then, of course, you, if you try to look at this object, you need to define the corresponding uh, location um, that will be input into the uh, convolutional model. So here we use the super Laplacian. So essentially, you uh, flatten uh, the tensor Laplacian that you'll get out of this multi-layer representation into a matrix form. Then uh, that results in the uh, super graph diffusion convolution layer where the diffusion goes uh, both across each layer and among multiple layers together. And finally, you combine uh, all of this uh, information uh, with, into getting the final embedding and uh, you know, we apply both global max pooling, global average pooling for each of uh, the corresponding uh, CNN models. And then eventually we get uh, the final uh, result, the forecast for uh, either for a state of a graph or a state of the uh, 
space time process. Have any questions at this stage? Okay. Uh, okay. If not, then um, I'll go to how, how, what, where it helps and how we applied it to real life. So we had three data sets, like a three, three types of data sets. One was um, traffic data in California. This is a standard data set um, for validating um, deep learning models. And I would particularly say graph neural networks for uh, space time prediction. Okay, so the nodes here are sensors and edges corresponds to road segments. And the goal here is to forecast traffic flow in California. These data are available uh, in public domain. Um, the second data set we looked at is um, uh, crypto assets, uh, Ethereum. So here are nodes are traders and edges are transactions between them. And uh, the goal is to predict the daily closing price. And finally, since, you know, uh, when we were working on this paper, COVID was still uh, there. So we also looked at uh, by surveillance uh, data um, in multiple states. So here, no, nodes are counties in the United States and ages were border connections. Those of official county adjustment uh, record. And the goal here was to um, understand the dynamics of COVID-19 hospitalization, so that's COVID-19 clinical severity. And those are respective uh, uh, data summaries for uh, traffic, Ethereum, and COVID data. Uh, so uh, for Ethereum, we looked at some of the most traded tokens, uh, Byton, Decentral, and, and Golem. This is also available, uh, publicly available right now, um, both in the package, and also we have a paper that, um, Europe's paper that highlights uh, the utility of this data set. So in case if, if anyone would like to look at this data and analyze uh, as a, for benchmark purposes. And for COVID-19, we looked at uh, California state and Texas. So uh, the highest number of nodes that you see was about 358. So it's still not super large, actually smaller networks, but it, I, I think that Comparing to uh, what exists right now in terms of application of multi-persistence, it's still a big step because usually those are much smaller data sets. And um, at that stage, I didn't see anyone in, in applying multi-persistence uh, to graphs. Okay, so let's uh, uh, look at, at the result. So uh, all of these models here uh, corresponds to a case we didn't use non-topological non summaries, except of uh, Z, zigzag uh, GCNet. This is one of our earlier papers where we use zigzag persistence uh, and quiver representation uh, across time points. Uh, so linking Monday, Monday, Tuesday, 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 Wednesday, and so on. Okay, so here's based on the zigzag persistence. Uh, and uh, this multi-persistent model that we discussed today. So we notice here that um, improvement in terms of all the you know standard criteria: uh, mean absolute error, RMC, mean absolute percentage error, and so on. Um, but it's interesting that. Um, how different it is across different types of data. So that's, that's I would say, the most uh, interesting so far. Some, um, I would say, la for sparse data, um, MP tends to give high gains uh, because the intuition here is that for sparse data, MP allows us to extract additional complementary information that is helpful for forecasting or for learning this particular object. Okay, but if you have a lot of information, like if a lot of data already, a lot of information already, so maybe single persistence will work as well. Okay, and maybe even better because it is uh, it is uh, computationally cheaper. 
now, uh, if we are going, and this hypothesis is actually confirmed uh, by looking at Ethereum data, because Ethereum data are sparse, yes? So, um, and you see for decentralizing volume, so the gains are substantially higher, I mean, than what we see on traffic forecasting. So, <clears throat> that suggests that, you know, more sparse data with rigid topology makes sense to use MP, it will help. But if you already have a lot of information, then just single persistent will, will work just well. Or maybe even you don't need uh, any, any TDA tool at all if you have uh, a lot of data and this data tend to be more homogeneous. But as long as you have heterogeneity and sparsity, that's where persistent homology, particularly multi-persistence, will start getting in and, and help you tremendously. And <clears throat> finally, uh, results on uh, COVID-19. So again, not surprisingly, we see here that for Texas, for sparse Texas, we have uh, a bit better performance than uh, for California. Okay. So now, and uh, this is the results, the uh, maps for uh, COVID-19 uh, by civilians. Um, and um, you see that in some of the counties, we have similar type of performance across all models, um, but um, some areas, particularly one with, uh, you know, sparse locations, um, the cells of uh, town are better than for more traditional stem gene and, and uh, uh, AG CRM model. Now, the next question that comes up, I mean, what, what can we say about if we simply use single, single persistence? That's the first question. And the second question, uh, what if we just do stacking as some other people did? So you simply, for example, take volume on uh, Ethereum tokens, to number uh, number of, like uh, volume of transactions and number of transactions, and just stack the results together. We call it filtration and sample. So why multi filtration is better? So here we results. So this is um, uh, based on decentralized. So this is uh, crypto crypto tokens, and you see the results on the same model. So we have exactly the same architecture. But here we use single filtration based either on degree, betweeners, power filtration based on number of transactions, power filtration based on volume. Here we combine them, but we treat them separately and just stack together, stack, stack the results together. And here, when we do this Euler point carrier surface approach, when we do uh, both filtering functions simultaneously, and then get uh, metric, the corresponding matrix representation in as a form of uh, Euler Poincaré surface. And you, it, it actually, to me, it was very surprising to see that indeed MP, the simultaneous approach, works much better. Okay, and if if on top of it you have also the right uh, filtering function, then the results become incomparably better. So you, you cannot you cannot simply do staking. It doesn't pick up the most important uh, features that uh, play a role, play an essential role behind the functionality of the uh, underlying uh, underlying object and the underlying system. So doing MP really helps if if you find a good computational method to extract it for this, especially for larger scale data. And uh, coming up to um, discussion of computational costs. So um, here uh, you can see the results on running time and the corresponding uh, mean absolute percentage error and computational complexity for each method based on uh, various types of uh, multi-persistence, so doing it uh, through our 
uh, version with uh, a linear algebra approach with Euler, -Concur Euler concurrent surface and uh, multi persistence um, landscape and uh, <clears throat> slicing arguments. Do you see if you do it for slicing arguments, the running time is like at least 10 times higher than doing it with Euler concurrent surface? But the results, mean absolute percentage error, are comparable. And they actually even slightly worse. Um, for uh, working with single persistence, with persistent images uh, that uh, Henry Adam has suggested in his group, of course, running times is incomparably lower because much, much cheaper. But of course, MAPE is also much higher. Okay, so in that sense, I believe that uh, bringing linear algebra toward uh, improving representation of uh, topological summaries that we get from multi-persistence has a lot of potential because in real life problems, you may sacrifice some stronger stability results and use something like weak L1 metric or some other similar uh, uh, metric around it, but you bring it to much more realistic scenarios and you can analyze uh, much bigger data sets. Although the data sets that we have analyzed here, they are still small, but it's still a big step comparing to uh, what has been done before. Um, I would like to go back to the, the general picture and um, complete with some discussion in future work. So uh, yes, MP is capable, uh, it's, it's, it, it, this results uh, demonstrate that it can capture some hidden time dependencies of more sophisticated high dimensional uh, objects that vary over time. And uh, what MP brings us is inaccessible with one parameter persistent homology. So, um, it also yields us more stable feature maps in dynamic scenarios. Okay. And it can, it can be a way, uh, although we have not discussed it here, but MP clearly has a way, um, pathway toward bringing a new, new insights into understanding suspicious activities. That is in general context of uh, anomaly detection. And for example, uh, uh, you know, deterring uh, and identifying the illicit uh, behavior or illegal behavior associated with uh, cryptocurrencies. And so when you analyze uh, uh, blockchain transaction graphs, both in terms of uh, volume and uh, number of transactions. So it has a lot of potential for anomaly detection. Um, much uh, lower computational cost of uh, this Euler point current surface ideas, or in this like linear algebra uh, ideas within multi persistence, um, has a potential to be the preferred choice for time condition topological learning and generally for uh, time condition uh, representation learning in ML. And of course, the results in terms of, we have pretty competitive, promising results in terms of uh, forecasting capabilities um, with much lower costs than, than other tools. So some of the ideas that we've discussed in our group uh, that <clears throat> seem to be uh, very promising, trying to combine MP with zigzag persistence. So that's, that's a little bit uh, redundant from one point of view, because you would say, okay, we, you do this dynamic Euler for current surface. I mean, you do it over time. Why do you need zigzag on top of it? Um, I would say one, it's not only capturing time dependency, uh, in, um, uh, homology, but it's also, uh, understanding what are the most prominent features that you observe over time in this object, okay? And that opens the path, for, for example, for transfer learning. When you learn something about power system in Dallas over time, and then you're going to a new location, say Mexico City or Houston, and you're trying to understand 
uh, how the power system in Houston and Mexico City will respond to natural hazards when you already have experience of doing it in Dallas. So zigzag persistence by using this quiver representation uh, allows you to extract some of the important information, some of the important signatures, uh, topological signatures of, of your data uh, over time. But this is done right now only through single persistence. Okay, so zigzag is only <clears throat> uh, based on the single persistence. So can we actually uh, fuse zigzag and quiver representation ideas with multi-persistence? So that we try to learn you know, the most representative, the most illustrative behavior of the underlying complex system through, you know, multiple filtration over time, and then bring it along multiple locations. So I think that it has a lot of potential uh, here. And finally, from my uh, uh, statistical expertise, uh, I would say that virtually nothing is done on statistical inference on MP summaries, but actually very, very little is done, been done on uh, statistical inference on persistent homology as well. But I, I would say those are some of the next, I would say that uh, you already have been told, but this is some of the uh, directions that we're likely gonna see in the next few years. And, you know, more and more papers and approaches will emerge at the intersection of both uh, single and multi-parameter persistence with statistical inference, because, you know, statisticians need that. And this is, uh, I guess, me. And I'd like to say thank you very much to uh, my co-authors, Yuju Chen, um, Ignacio Segovia Dominguez, and Varish Kutkunuzer. And... And of course, I need to say thank you very much to all the sponsors, who, <laughs> funding agencies who provided uh, support. That was NSF <coughs> and uh, Department of uh, Navy, Office of Naval Research. And uh, also um, part of this work uh, has been done uh, through uh, IRD, Individual Research and Development uh, funding that I get as NSF program director. And I need to say that any opinions, findings, conclusions, recommendations, and expressed in these materials are just ours, not of NSF or ONR. Okay. And thank you very much. Well, Yulia, thank you for a very interesting talk. So the floor is open for questions. I've got one about using MP to predict the future. You were able to do it for COVID hospitalizations. Can you also do it for blockchain? The probability that somebody's going to do a ransomware attack? Well, ransomware, we did only single persistence, but yes, <laughs> yes, you can. That's actually was original motivation. That, 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 was, that was the original motivation for doing MP. That's how I, I came to MP. Because we analyzed a lot of this uh, uh, data related to uh, crypto, and we found that it's always both are important, both number of transactions and volume, and how to link them together. So we did some very ad hoc approach originally, something like based on the small subgraphs, what we call changes, uh, but it's very ad hoc. And that is how I discovered MP, really, because I, I think that MP allows you to get exactly what this information, that subtle information uh, on illegal activity that you don't get with any other tool, and not even with full persistence. Very interesting. Also, in your multi-persistence, you went with two filtration functions, little f and little g. Yeah. Would it be reasonable or useful to go to more than two? You can do more than two, of course. Uh, it's, I mean, then you need to have a tender. Yes. So, because you see, the, 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 the thing here we use, then you have a matrix, yes. So, that's, that's nice. But if you have three, you'll have a tender. So, theoretically, it is possible, but it will, it, like, you won't have any more, uh, you know, all your surface 
as a matrix, you have a tensor. And tensor is another, <laughs> is another thing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> How to deal with, like, I mean, you can flatten it and still feed in into scene, and of course, yes, you, you can. So the answer, the short answer is years. The longer answer is that uh, depending on computational costs and so on, there are some limitations. Maybe computationally insane to do that, so. I mean, for smaller data, you can probably do it for smaller data set, but for bigger one, it also depends on how sparse it's going to be. Yeah. Maybe one thing is that of doing that, if you have a tensor out of it, and then instead of feeding the whole tensor, you can have some summary out of this tensor, you know? You can maybe take a spectrum of a tensor, like a generalized tensor Z eigenvalues or something like that, and then, so yeah. Okay, how about some other questions? Hearing none, I'd like to thank you, Yulia, for a great talk. Thank you.